So in this video, I'm going to provide a recap of the information required for axial deformation. So to start off with, I've drawn a member um, which has a cross-sectional area of A and a length of L. This is its initial length. So I'm going to put this uh, member into tension. So I've applied a force P here and a P here to pull it on either end. And what I was, would expect is that um, as a result, the length of this member is going to increase. So this extra little piece in here is the change in length. And I'm going to call this delta. Okay. So this is the change in length. And if you want to, you can think it about it as the axial deformation. It's the same thing. So I'm going to try and get out the main equation for axial deformation, which is that it's equal to PL on AE. Okay. So in order to get this, I'm going to start with looking at the equation for Young's modulus, which is equal to the change in the stress divided by the change in the strain through the linear region of my stress-strain curve. Now we always know that our um, stress-strain curves start at the point zero, 0, So if I just quickly draw one, I'm going to use the point zero, 0. It's got some linear region and then it does whatever else in this plastic region. So if I pick another point on the curve, it's going to be my, um, sorry, I should put the x component first. So whatever strain this corresponds to and whatever stress this corresponds to. I can calculate my Young's modulus as being the difference in the stress divided by the difference in the strain, which simplifies just to a stress divided by a strain. So now what I want to do is substitute some things in for stress and strain. So I should be able to develop some other relationships. So if we start with the normal stress, we know it's equal to the force divided by the cross-sectional area. So on this example I've drawn, I've called the force P. And the cross-sectional area is going to be A. So this is one relationship that I'm going to be able to substitute into this equation. The other thing I'm going to want to sub out is my strain. And we know this is equal to the change in length divided by the initial length. So the change is our axial deformation, which we're calling delta, and the uh, original length is L. So if I put both of these um, equations into my one for Young's modulus, I'm going to try and rearrange it to get the axial deformation on its own. So we're going to get that E is equal to the stress, which is P on A, divided by the strain, which is delta on L. And I'm rearranging it for delta. So if I move all this up to the top line, I'm going to get delta on L is uh, multiplied by E is equal to P on A. So delta on its own is going to equal P, moving L up, uh, moving E down. I'm going to get delta is equal to P L on A E. And this is our, our main equation that we're going to be using because in here, Delta is the axial deformation or the change in length of your member. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is what happens when you have a variation in properties through a, a member. So the properties that we're talking about are going to be um, the uh, force, so P, the cross-sectional area A, and also the Young's modulus of the material E. So when these properties change, the total axial deformation is going to be equal to the sum of PL on AE for each of the sections. So you need to divide up your member. So let's pretend that we have a member that has a really thick bit and a really thin bit, and then, I don't know, a really thick bit again. We're going to need to divide it up into three different sections, because if we had, say, a force here and a force here applied on either end, we're just going to sum it up. So we're going to work out the properties, so the force through this section, the length of this section, the cross-sectional area of this section, and E for this section. We're then going to work it out for this next bit, and then work out all of them for this next bit, and add them all together. So the only trick here is um, thinking about the direction that we're going to need to use for the equation. So
So the first case is if we have a tension section. So what we would expect then is if this is our member, our internal load is going to be pulling away from our member. So this is P. So if something is in tension, we need to have a positive value when it goes into this equation. Okay, so it's going to be positive PL on AE. If we have a compression section, then it's the opposite. So when we look at the internal load through any of these sections, we're going to have a force that's pushing onto our member, and it's going to try and make it smaller in its length. Therefore, when we put it into our summing equation, we need to make sure it goes in as negative. So it's going to be a negative PL on AE, and that's going to count for the drop in its length. So now I'm just going to quickly go through a procedure that you can use to be able to analyze these questions. So the first thing that you're going to want to do is to cut through each section and analyze the internal axial load. So you're trying to find the P that sits inside this PL on AE equation. The next thing that you're going to want to do is identify whether each section is intentional compression, as discussed just now, because um, that's going to determine whether you're going to put it in as a positive or a negative value for the deformation in the equation. The last step that you have is then to sum all the deformations across your sections, and you can use PL on AE to do that. All right, so the only other thing to cover on this is compatibility. So if I just scroll down a little bit. So compatibility conditions are used to solve statically indeterminate problems. So that's a fancy way of saying that you have more unknowns than you have equations to be able to deal with it. Okay, so remember for your equilibrium equations, you have sum of forces in x is 0, sum of forces in y is 0, and sum of moments are equal to 0. If you still have more unknowns than equations, so more than three unknowns, you're not going to be able to solve. So what we do is develop these compatibility conditions, and they provide you with an extra equation that is able to relate the deformation of individual parts of the system. So you might know that two parts of your system have to deform exactly the same amount. Um, or for example, you may know that the sum of some of the um, deformations need to add to a certain value. So they're the main different ones that you have, um, but obviously it's very question dependent as to what the compatibility condition is that you can use. So there's going to be two examples that I do um, using compatibility conditions. So I'll leave the rest of that um, to discussion in those videos. So I think that's all there is for this axial deformation topic. And uh, I'll see you in those examples.